The year was 1983. Star Wars Episode 6 had just come out. Michael Jackson was on top of the world, and Nintendo released Super Mario Bros. for the Famicom and the Nintendo Entertainment System, or the NES for short. Video games up until this point were basically viewed as a novelty somewhat. Pong was an extremely significant milestone in video game history, what with its simple appeal and easily accessible nature, but even so, Pong mostly is significant in that it got a ton of people to pay attention to video games as a thing that even existed in the first place. Other than that, I don't think you really hear many people praising Pong for its complex game design. I mean, the technology wasn't really there yet, and I don't think many people viewed video games as an artistic medium at the time of Pong's release. Until the NES and Super Mario Bros. Super Mario Bros. was a game that wasn't about high score. What made this game stand out from a lot of the releases at the time was that this game was about the adventure. It had a variety of different worlds, multiple music tracks, and the goal of the game was contextualized with a storyline. A very simple and basic storyline saved the princess, but still, it was there, and that was enough to get people excited. But most importantly, this game spawned an insanely popular mascot character in Mario. Mario is the face of Nintendo, it's no doubt. When you think of Nintendo, Mario probably just subconsciously wiggles his way into your mind, and this is absolutely by design. He's one of the most famous video game characters of all time. In 1983, he was on top of the video game world, and Nintendo had a amazing success marketing him to a Western audience, and this is one of the most important points. But our friend Mario wasn't done with just one game. He would go on to have great success throughout the 80s on the NES, but the 90s were soon approaching, and Nintendo was ready. In the year 1990, they came out with a home run smash of a video game console called the Super Nintendo, and Mario had a killer app released for the console's launch in Super Mario World. Now, Super Mario World is possibly one of the greatest game console launch titles of all time. This Mario game featured 16-bit graphics with beautiful visual art design that still holds up to this day, an expanded cast of characters, a more robust world to explore with a huge world map system with all these secrets and all these intricate things you could do. It seemed like Mario was the premier video game mascot character, reigning over the video game landscape atop his throne. Nothing could stop him. Nothing at all, except there was one fatal flaw Mario had a crack in his armor and something that could not be mended. He was too slow. <laughs> Only a year later, Mario's throne would be tested by none other than the blue blur himself, Sonic the Hedgehog. Sonic the Hedgehog is one of the most iconic video game characters as well, and this is no accident. Sega designed this character in 1990 by hosting a company-wide contest to design a mascot character who could rival Mario. Sega's previous mascot character from 1986, Alex Kidd, was garbage, and as a result wasn't popular at all. This was clearly a failed attempt at rivaling Mario's widespread success so they decided to go back to the drawing board. Alex Kidd was a series of platformer games for the Sega Master System originally, which is Sega's equivalent to the NES. But with the advent of the Super Nintendo and the next generation of consoles, it was time for Sega to put their best foot forward if they wanted to rival Super Mario World and come out with a game that would sell their new console, the Sega Genesis. And so the company-wide contest to design the most appealing character ever began. The Sega Genesis had 16-bit graphics and blast processing capabilities, so the potential for what their new character could do in that environment seemed promising. Naoto Oshima, who was the lead character designer for the Fantasy Star series, submitted a ton of designs for the mascot contest. Some of them include a rabbit character and a fat mustache man in pajamas, who would later be reworked into being Dr. Eggman, the series' main villain. The rabbit character was the favorite character among the company and was initially chosen to be Sega's new mascot. The initial concept for the game featuring this rabbit character was that he would run around picking up items with his ears and throwing them at enemies. This design was scrapped though as programmer Yuji Naka stepped into the project and wanted a character who was based around the concept of speed. He was really fascinated with moving vehicles and really wanted to do something that would show off the capabilities of the new hardware and would provide a unique gimmick for the character to make it stand out. As Mario levels were usually slow and more calculated, he wanted a game that was about momentum and speed. 
game director Hirokazu Yasuhara stepped in and looked over Oshima's design documents and noticed a small drawing of a hedgehog character in the corner. This design was brought to Oshima and was chosen as the mascot character for their fast moving platformer game. The hedgehog was chosen because of his quills which would look good as he sped across the screen and also because it would be ironic and funny to have a slow moving animal move so fast in the game. The character was originally named Mr. Hedgehog and then later his name was changed to Mr. Needle Mouse, taking inspiration from characters like Felix the Cat and Mickey Mouse. Mr. Needle Mouse's blue color was meant to be a reflection of Sega's logo and his red and white shoes were inspired by Santa Claus. His overall body shape was meant to resemble Michael Jackson and his quick tempered get it done no nonsense attitude was inspired by Bill Clinton of all people who at the time was the governor of Arkansas in the United States and would later go on to become the United States president. Sega clearly took the approach of looking to western cartoon characters and pop culture references when designing their flagship character. They wanted him to be a character who could stand among the ranks of Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny as a classic iconic cartoon character who is instantly recognizable and I think they succeeded in that department 100%. Finally after going through a bunch of design iterations they changed the character's name to Sonic the Hedgehog from Mr. Needle Mouse and our boy was born into the world but unlike our friend Mario Sonic was given some more defined personality traits to go along with his character designs and these traits would go on to be expanded upon changed and morph in certain ways to fit with the time period changing but I would say the core of Sonic's character is that he's a cool 90s kid who likes to go fast has a bold and snarky nature likes to take charge and likes to have fun and his favorite food is chili dogs and he also loves his friends and has a good heart now I think these defined personality traits are something that makes Sonic stand out and something that makes him work, but also could be a reason why he isn't as popular as Mario. Because Mario is more of a blank slate, I feel like you can sort of mold and mesh him into whatever scenario you want. Sonic has a more defined personality, so what he can be is somewhat limited, though his personality isn't so defined that it couldn't be changed and shaped over time. It's interesting to compare the approach that the two different teams made when approaching these characters. So anyhow, with Sega's flagship mascot character designed, they had another huge task ahead of them. Make a game that could rival Super Mario World and the Mario franchise as a whole. And this game needed to convince people to buy their Sega Genesis console instead of the Super Nintendo. This was a huge task, and so in 1991, Sega released Sonic the Hedgehog for the Sega Genesis. The game was a huge success, especially in North America. Sonic became an iconic video game character and gained huge popularity among kids at the time. Sonic the Hedgehog 1 is a very simple platforming game that doesn't focus heavily on story, but there still is one, told mostly through the game's instruction manual. The story of this game takes place on an island called South Island, which is a mysterious island that moves around the ocean magically and has no defined location. This island is also said to hold the six mysterious Chaos Emeralds, which are emeralds that hold the power to give energy to any living being on the earth. These Chaos Emeralds are an important part of the series and will become a lot more important later on. But anyways, a mad genius named Dr. Robotnik sets up a base on South Island called the Scrap Brain Zone and plans to hunt down the Chaos Emeralds in order to harness their power for his mechanical creations. To carry out this plan, he builds robots and traps every animal on the island inside of them and forces them to search the island for the Emeralds. Sonic the Hedgehog notices that Dr. Robotnik has turned all the inhabitants of South Island into robots and plans to stop Dr. Robotnik from carrying out his evil plans. Interestingly, Dr. Robotnik is a name that was only given to our main villain in the North American release. In Japan, he's always been known as Dr. Eggman. Anyways, you play the game going through the different zones throughout and eventually you reach the Scrap Brain Zone and defeat Dr. Robotnik. If you collect the six Chaos Emeralds throughout the game, you get the ending screen which shows Sonic turning South Island back to normal and all the roboticized animals being freed from their robot cages. If you don't collect all six Chaos Chaos Emeralds throughout the game though, you get a screen that says try again. Pretty harsh if you ask me. This game is a 2D platformer that's designed around moving fast throughout the levels and using momentum based platforming. Going down slopes in the game increases your speed and you maintain your momentum as you run throughout the stage. This was a revolutionary concept in 1991 and was something that hadn't been done before in a game, really. At least not to this extent and it still holds up very well. Rings are collected throughout the game and if you get hit by an enemy, all your rings scatter around you. you have a 
a short window to collect them back before they despawn though. Get hit with zero rings and you lose a life. The ring system is a great health system for the type of fast paced gameplay that Sonic is going for. As you move throughout the stages, enemies and obstacles will appear in your path as roadblocks. This is the entire challenge of the game, and allowing the player to quickly recover health back after getting hit by something in their path allows for just enough punishment to allow them time to reflect, while also getting the player back into the action really fast. I've always liked this system the classic Sonic games have, and I think it's something that allows for a lot of versatility and challenge. Your ability to recover health back easier is entirely determined by how many rings you collected before you got hit. The more rings you have, the more you stand to lose, but also the more you can recover as a safety net for later. This is the push and pull of the game, so to speak, and actually provides a huge incentive to actually collect the collectibles throughout this stage, and this is something that Mario really doesn't have. Collecting coins in Mario really doesn't have that much of a gameplay incentive other than when you collect 100 you get an extra life, which is a pretty good incentive but isn't as direct as Sonic's incentive. I think the ring health system is at its best when playing levels like Green Hill Zone, Spring Yard Zone, Starlight Zone, and Scrap Brain Zone, which I think are all designed with speed and roadblock-like enemy and obstacle placement in mind. These stages keep the momentum going and are the highlight of the game. I think many people would agree with that. Whenever I get to run fast and do elaborate tricks and jumps in a 2D Sonic game is when I'm having the most fun. Unfortunately though, Sonic 1 doesn't have one of my favorite 2D Sonic mechanics yet, which is the spin dash move introduced in Sonic 2. This move allows for quick momentum build on the spot. Instead, in Sonic 1, you have to roll into a ball and go down slopes to build up momentum. It's a system that allows for less versatility than what we would see in later games. It's not an overall deal breaker at all. And since the levels are designed around it, it really feels good most of the time. What can be a deal breaker though, is two of the most infamous zones in the first game, those being Marble Zone and Labyrinth Zone, which both have very little emphasis on speed and more of an emphasis on careful and methodical platforming. Labyrinth Zone being especially tedious due to it being an underwater level where Sonic can drown in if he spends too much time under the water. These zones aren't terrible per se, but I think they could have used some reworking. They feel like pace breakers somewhat in an otherwise fast-paced action-packed platformer game. Conceptually, they look and sound great though, and that's one of the biggest strengths of this game. The music and graphics are amazing. Much better than anything Mario was offering at the time, for sure. The backgrounds and color palette are perfect, and Sonic's animations have so much character and life. The music is fun, energetic, and will stick in your head forever. It's one of the main reasons I don't even mind Marvel Zone or Labyrinth Zone that much. The music is just too good. These games have an iconic look and feel to them, and one of the things about this game that sticks out the most in my mind is the trippy weird backgrounds of the game's special stages, which are accessed by collecting 50 rings in a stage and jumping through a giant ring at the end. These special stages are how you collect the Chaos Emeralds. The backgrounds have a ton of strange imagery of animals and shapes and colors. It's just pure aesthetic and reminds me of some kind of weird, dark, surreal carnival madness. The music also perfectly represents this. And so with all this, the first Sonic game was a smash hit success and is generally regarded as a great game even to this day. I love it a lot and have played it many times. I think it's one of the best platforming games of its era and served as a great foundation of what was to come next in the series. Sega had something special on their hands, a franchise that would go on to spawn cartoons, comics, toys, and eventually, way in the future, a live action movie. But right after the success of the first game, they capitalized on it by releasing a portable version. An 8-bit version of the first Sonic game released for the handheld Sega Game Gear system and Sega's previous 8-bit console, the Sega Master System, on December 28th, 1991. It's essentially the same game as the Genesis version, just with lower fidelity graphics and sound and a few minor changes in level design. This would start a trend of Sega releasing downgraded or reworked versions of console Sonic games for handheld systems, something they continued to do for a long time even in the modern Sonic era. This business model would also be taken into account when creating the much hyped sequel Sonic the Hedgehog 2. But before Sonic 2 was developed, Sega would take a strange detour and get a little experimental with online play in the form of the Japanese exclusive Mega Modem, which was an add-on for the Sega Mega Drive, which again is the Japanese name for the Sega Genesis. The Mega Modem 
was a peripheral that attached to the Sega Mega Drive console, which allowed it to connect to the internet and access Sega-specific online services. One of these services was the Sega Mega Net, which allowed users to play certain games that supported the Mega Modem online with other Mega Modem users. The Sega Mega Net was a monthly subscription service that costed 800 yen a month. The Sega game Toshikon was a cartridge that was sold that allowed Sega Mega Net users to download select games to it that were only available through this service. One of these games was Sonic Eraser, which was a simple puzzle game in the style of Puyo Puyo Pop. Gameplay consists of the player controlling falling blocks and matching three of them in a line to make them disappear. It's a very simple puzzle game for the time. Unfortunately, not much more information is really known about this game since it was only available through this commercial failure of an online service, which failed and was discontinued a year after its launch. Ouch. We see a lot of gaming news and online reviewers complain about microtransactions and games as a service as if it's a new thing only just now surfacing in the modern era. But what I find interesting is that if you look back, this kind of thing has kind of always been there in some form or the other. It's fascinating to me to see a company try something like this so early on. Kind of a risky move at the time in hindsight. And it was an early example of Sega failing to push a piece of their hardware. But trust me, we'll get to that later. Anyways, Sega wasn't about to let a simple flop like that stop the empire they were building with Sonic the Hedgehog. Because shortly after Sonic 1 was released, the proper full sequel was put into development. But uh, yeah, Sonic's 2 development wasn't going to happen without some issues. You see, with the development of the first Sonic game, the main programmer behind the game, Yuji Naka, the character designer who won the design contest and came up with Sonic's design, Naoto Oshima, and the game director and level designer, Hirokazu Yasuhara, were the three key members of Sonic Team, which was a division of Sega that was formed to handle Sonic game development. Well, you see, after Sonic 1 was a success, ideas about a sequel were obviously floating around, but Yuji Naka in the suits of Sega of Japan ran ran into some conflict. The Sega higher-ups were mad at how long Yuji Naka took to program the game, among other things, and wanted a quicker release schedule. Yuji Naka was fed up by this pressure and was worried about the inner politics and business aspects of Sega as a corporation. So he quit. One of the key members of the original Sonic team was now gone from the company. But meanwhile, over in America, a man named Mark Cerny was working for Sega's STI division, which stood for the Sega Technical Institute. The Sega Technical Institute was designed as a division of Sega to recruit new talent to work for the games industry. Mark Cerny hired on many talented individuals to work on other Sega projects and properties, but he had a bigger plan in mind. He got an idea. An awful idea. Mark Cerny had a wonderful, awful idea. Actually, it was a great idea, and it was really smart. You see, Cerny had already previously convinced the director of Sonic 1, Hirokazu Yasuhara, to move to the United States to be part of the Sega Technical Institute after development of Sonic 1 was finished. So he had a core member of Sonic Team locked down for his studio already. But once he learned about Yuji Naka leaving Sega of Japan, he quickly seized the opportunity and convinced Yuji Naka to work at the STI. After some negotiations, promising Yuji Naka a better salary and an executive position in the studio, Yuji Naka agreed and moved to the United States to work for the STI, essentially coming back to Sega and leveraging more creative control and payment over his work. The third core member of Sonic Team, character designer Naoto Oshima, decided to stay at Sega's Japanese studio though, and actually would later go on to work on the game Sonic CD. So with two members of Sonic Team back together, and a brand new studio and country to work from, development on Sonic 2 would begin. During development, one of the first things that was conceived was the multiplayer features that were added to the game. Yuji Naka didn't get to add multiplayer in the first game because of time restraints from Sega, and so naturally, he was able to implement it in the sequel. To have a second player to race against in the game for the two-player mode, the character Tails was created. Tails is one of the most iconic characters in the Sonic franchise, and has been a mainstay ever since he was introduced. He's Sonic's best friend, and sort of acts as a little brother figure. He looks up to Sonic for support always, and has a happy outlook on life. His two tails allow him to fly around, and he follows Sonic throughout the main storyline of the game. He can also be playable in multiplayer and in single player when a second controller is plugged in. Hmm... I think we might be missing something here. Oh wait, hold on. Let me call upon my friend, fellow Tails expert, and YouTuber, Matthew Wistance, and let's have him explain to you the appeal of Tails the Fox. Sonic is basically perfect, 
but Tails isn't, and that's why I really like it. You always get the sense that Tails is like learning and doing his absolute best when Sonic is just effortlessly being Sonic. Uh, and Tails is just radiating determination and just hoping to someday be like him, as, as it says in his song. I think that description is more relevant to the older games and adventure games because they have a whole arc of Tails uh, relying on Sonic initially and then learning to do things himself, like at the end of Adventure 1. But following those games, Tails has kind of grown into his own character that isn't just kind of, you know, Sonic's friend. <laughs> but the friendship is still a really big part of the character and one of my favourite things about him. Tails is in a bit of a, a divisive state <laughs> among fans because uh, he's a lot less, uh, I don't know, active, a lot less capable than he used to be. Just kind of hanging around at the back doing science stuff while Sonic is uh, doing the fun stuff. I think the new IDW comics have a really great uh, balance between Tails as like a science guy but also, you know, someone who does go out there and runs fast. <laughs> Definitely check that out if you're missing the good old Adventure Tales. Another thing is that I think he's designed really cleverly and just portrayed really cleverly. Um, when I was young, I didn't know if Tails was a boy or a girl, I thought he was a girl. And whether that's, you know, intentional or not, it's definitely very present and influences how people see the character. He's almost like gender neutral, like, for someone who doesn't know him, you could believe that he's a boy or a girl if they told you. Um, and I think that also makes him just really, I don't know, easy to relate to. And the last thing is that he's just so cute and I love him and he just radiates determination and he wants to do his best and I love him. Thanks, Matt. You can check Matt out at Matthew W on YouTube and at Matthew Wistance on Twitter. He's a filmmaker who made a really cool short film stop motion animation called The Hullabaloo at Hornbeam Farm. It's really good. Check it out. Now back to Sonic 2. Another key ambition the developers had was to make this game 18 zones long. They wanted it to be bigger and better than the last game. This didn't happen though due to a Christmas 1992 deadline. So alas, the 7 zones we have in the game are what we're left with. Another weird feature that was left on the cutting room floor almost immediately was the time travel. For some reason the developers really liked the time travel idea but couldn't implement it. They didn't stop hammering on on this idea though because time travel would be saved for Sonic CD. They finally got their time travel in. Sonic 2's game design in the final product is a huge improvement on Sonic 1 though. One of the biggest additions to this game that I touched on before is the spin dash move which allows Sonic to roll up into a ball and gain momentum on the spot. This allows for more versatility in Sonic's options when it comes to traversal. No longer do you have to rely on the game's geography to gain momentum momentum, you can gain it on the spot and potentially build up enough momentum to jump farther and get somewhere you couldn't otherwise. The level design also accommodates this. The level design in Sonic 2 is way more open-ended than Sonic 1, with a lot more branching pathways and secret locations. Oftentimes when you get hit in this game and fall off a cliff, the game is designed so that you might fall onto another platform and discover a whole new path. This was in Sonic 1, but it's greatly expanded upon in Sonic 2. I mean, if you look at the Sonic two maps, it looks, that it, it looks like a crazy spaghetti madness with all the pathways you can go on. And this fits better with Sonic's speed mechanics, as your momentum is stopped less often by the level design. Unlike Sonic 1, Sonic 2 has no levels that don't take advantage of the momentum and the speed mechanics of Sonic. Even the water level in this game is super fast and has a ton of interesting pathways. You can even avoid the water entirely if you know what pathway to take. Sonic 2 also has only two acts for each zone in the game, instead of three like in the first game. This is a great improvement as it keeps every zone feeling fast and concise while also being bigger and better realized in its level design. I love Sonic 2. It's one of my favorite Sonic games ever and is my favorite classic Sonic game. I love the level design and I love the overall flow and aesthetic of the game. This game pretty much does what it sets out to do. Just be a better version of Sonic 1, really. And it was promoted hugely, especially in North America. This game had an unprecedented worldwide simultaneous release date in 1992, and it was dubbed as Sonic Tuesday. Kind of a clever little pun. This game skyrocketed Sonic's popularity. Sega was rolling in cash at this point. They had one of the most marketable characters at the time, for sure. He was everywhere. People loved Sonic. 
There's no doubt about it. And this game expanded the Sonic mythos and universe by adding in Tails and a bunch of new characters, concepts, and ideas. This game is also the first entry in the first major story arc in the Sonic universe, known as the Death Egg Saga. The story of Sonic 2 starts after defeating Eggman on South Island. Sonic gets bored of laying around and decides to once again travel the world like he usually does in his spare time. He flies around the world in his biplane called the Tornado and lands upon a place called West Side Island. While running around West Side Island, he begins to suspect that someone is following him but pays little mind to it. Turns out Tails the Fox is secretly following him. Tails chases after Sonic and begins to admire his speed and his cool and confident attitude. Eventually Sonic notices and begins to accept Tails as his traveling partner and thus their friendship begins. Soon after, Tails finds Sonic sleeping under a wing of his Tornado plane and they hear a loud explosion in the distance. They see a large pillar of fire and an army of robots in the distance and hear Robotnik's evil laugh. They immediately begin to chase after Robotnik and stop his evil plans. Robotnik had been previously secretly following Sonic to West Island the whole time, and once he arrived, he learned that there was once a race of people on the island who achieved great power through the use of mysterious stones. The stones were hidden away on the island by the gods though, as the people began to use the stones for their own corrupt gains. Robotnik assumes these stones to be the Chaos Emeralds, and plans on finding them and using them to power his Death Egg, which is a giant floating space station he built with the power to destroy the Earth. It is also a direct reference to Star Wars' Death Star. They really laid it on thick with the pop culture references. Anyways, he plans on taking over the world with it. Sonic and Tails both go through each zone on West Side Island, and eventually they both get on the tornado and fly up to the Death Egg. The tornado is shot at and damaged, but Sonic still manages to jump on board the Death Egg where he fights Eggman, who is piloting a giant mech. Sonic destroys the mech, causing it to explode and damaging the Death Egg and knocking it out of Earth's orbit. Sonic falls down to Earth and is rescued by Tails, who catches him in the tornado. And if the player collects all now seven, instead of six like at the first game, Chaos Emeralds, during their playthrough, Sonic will fly alongside the tornado as Super Sonic, who is a glowing, golden, Super Saiyan-like, powerful being who can just tear through everything. You could also play as Super Sonic throughout the stages in the game, and it's so awesome you're like invincible and like the more rings you collect the more time you have as supersonic it's so cool yeah th i mean this game this game is just amazing and as i said before in the sonic 1 section they did release an 8-bit version for the game gear and the master system actually this version came out slightly before the main version in europe and actually technically that makes the game gear version of sonic 2 the first time tails ever appeared it's clear at this point that sega's business model was to create spin-off and side games to capitalize on the brand of Sonic the Hedgehog, and so in 1993, for their next game, they did just that with Sega Sonic the Hedgehog for the arcade. Released exclusively for Japanese arcade cabinets, you control the game with a trackball as you move around seven isometric levels on Dr. Robotnik's island that he's trapped our three heroes on, those three heroes being Sonic the Hedgehog, Mighty the Armadillo, and Ray the Flying Squirrel. This was the introduction of Ray the Flying Squirrel and Mighty the Armadillo, and they had very little presence in the Sonic franchise and wouldn't really appear in any major way until Sonic Media, which was released way later on. Anyways, this game is a very simple arcade game where you avoid traps that spring up throughout the level and try to get throughout the levels. The next major entry in the Sonic the Hedgehog franchise though was to be Sonic CD. Now, remember when I talked about Yuji Naka and Hirokazu Yasuhara being hired by the Sega Technical Institute and moving to America to work on Sonic 2? Well, Naoto Oshima, the third core member of Sonic Team, as I said before, stayed behind. And Sega of Japan had a new project for him to work on. You see, Sega of Japan wanted a launch title for their new add-on for the Sega Genesis known as the Sega CD. They wanted a new Sonic the Hedgehog game to really sell and promote their add-on. The Sega CD was literally an add-on that you attached on top of the Sega Genesis console, which allowed it to play CD games. At first, Sega considered just porting Sonic 1 to the thing, and maybe enhancing the graphics a little bit to show off the new capabilities of CD technology. But they decided against this, and they decided to build a whole new Sonic game from the ground up. And since Naoto 
Kazuto Oshima was the only member of Sonic Team that actually stayed in Japan, they decided to have him be the director of the project, and thus, development on Sonic CD started. To avoid conflict between the American team working on Sonic 2 and the Japanese team working on Sonic CD, the Japanese team working on Sonic CD actually contacted the American team and exchanged ideas and concepts, making sure that the two games didn't take from one another or weren't too similar to each other, since both of the games were actually being developed simultaneously. This is why the time travel mechanic that was originally supposed to be in Sonic 2 made its way into Sonic CD, as Naoto Oshima really loved this time travel mechanic. And this is also why the spin dash isn't in Sonic CD, but instead the super peel out move was added to Sonic CD instead, which is really just the worst version of the spin dash, but you know, they were experimenting at the time, so it is what it is. The spin dash wasn't a mainstay in the series at this point just yet. The way the time travel mechanic works in Sonic CD is that the player has to build up enough momentum and go through these signs that take you to another version of the level with different aesthetics and different design elements. Naoto Oshima wanted the time travel segment to be seamless and have no loading screen, but the problem was the main, the lead programmer on the project, Matsuhide Mizoguchi, thought that it was impossible to have time travel without a loading sequence. So what they did to compromise for this was they had a loading screen where Sonic was seen traveling through time in a flashing sequence. Naoto Oshima didn't like this too much, but decided it was a good compromise, and the loading screen really isn't that long, all things considered, but years later, Oshima reflected and he felt that if Yuji Naka had actually been a part of the project, that he would have found a way to code it to where there was no loading screen. But alas, since Sonic Team was split up, this is what they had to work with, and the final product isn't terrible. It, it works. The time travel mechanic is fine. It just, sometimes at points in the game, it leaves the level design feeling weird and disjointed. Like, you always feel like the main level that you play through is the real level design, and sometimes the other alternate time versions of the levels feel like just afterthoughts. This is a problem that's present in Sonic CD's entire design, really. It's not bad. A lot of the levels feel like a sort of mishmash of elements or like almost like a fan-made ROM hack of the first Sonic game. It just feels like they tried to add on to Sonic's design in a way that didn't complement his mechanics like in Sonic 2. You can feel the absence of the other two core members of Sonic Team, but by no means is it a bad game. I would actually compare it to Dark Souls 2 because Dark Souls 2 had the absence of director Hidetaka Miyazaki and it you feel like the developers that working on that game really wanted to create a game that was in his vision, but just couldn't because he wasn't there. It's that kind of thing, you know? It's not bad, it just doesn't feel like the real Sonic 2, which is probably why it's not named Sonic 2, and Sonic 2 is named Sonic 2. But even still, it's still a pretty good game. And since this game was CD-based, we had a new feature added to the Sonic the Hedgehog universe, which was an FMV cutscene. The intro to Sonic CD starts off with this amazing animation sequence and this theme song, and it's just so cool. It's the first of this kind of thing in the Sonic franchise, and it's just amazing. The story of this game is actually more robust and interesting. The story is that there exists a place called Never Lake, where for one month out of the year, a miniature planet called Little Planet appears above it. On Little Planet, time moves freely and can speed up or slow down in a blink of the eye, changing the planet's form sporadically. Dr. Robotnik hears about this place and also hears rumors about the seven time stones that are on the island. These time stones are what allow the planet to have this weird time control. Robotnik goes to the planet and tethers it to the ground with giant chains, keeping it afloating above Never Lake. He sets his robot army off to hunt for the seven time stones so that he could control time and rule the world. Sonic the Hedgehog coincidentally also was on his way to visit Little Planet after hearing rumors about its strange time shifting properties. When he comes across it, he sees the chains attached to it and Robotnik's giant logo on the side of it. He climbs up the chains and gets on the planet, ready to defeat Robotnik once again. Meanwhile, Amy Rose, a pink hedgehog, who is Sonic's number one fangirl and self-proclaimed girlfriend, plays with tarot cards and receives a future reading that she is destined to have a fateful encounter with Sonic on Little Planet. So she travels there as well and finds Sonic there. Sonic isn't too pleased to see that she's on the planet and fears that she will be in danger now that Robotnik's army has taken over the place. Sonic's fears are confirmed when Robotnik's latest invention, Metal Sonic, kidnaps Amy and runs off. 
So now Sonic has to save Amy and collect all seven time stones and defeat Robotnik. Sonic eventually races Metal Sonic in Stardust Speedway Zone and defeats him, saving Amy Rose. Sonic then eventually defeats Dr. Eggman once again. If the player collects every time stone in the game, then Little Planet returns to its natural state and leaves Never Lake. If the player doesn't collect all the time stones though, Little Planet leaves Never Lake, but Robotnik uses the seven time stones to turn back time and retake it. And Sonic is seen going back into Little Planet to stop Eggman once again. This story has a lot more elements going on in it and is conveyed more through the gameplay. The story also introduces two key characters in the Sonic universe, Amy Rose and Metal Sonic. Amy Rose is a character who will become much more important later on, but is defined by her love for Sonic the Hedgehog despite his complete and utter just ambivalence towards her. He doesn't really care about her that much, but he's friends with her, but he's not in love with her like she's in love with him. Overall, Sonic CD wasn't as successful as Sonic 2 due to it being exclusive to the Sega CD. The Sega CD wasn't that commercially successful in Japan or in America. Not many games were released for it as a result of not many people buying it. Sega really failed to market it well and its popularity didn't catch on at all. In fact, Sonic CD as a game didn't reach popularity until it was re-released later and then it gained a sort of cult following. The game is popular with a lot of people and many people consider it to be one of the best classic Sonic games. Though the level design and the time travel gimmick really just don't work well with me. I think this game feels more like a weird detour than a proper sequel and is more of a footnote in the Sonic franchise to me, but I realize a lot of people love it. Just for me, it isn't as appealing as the other ones and it's kind of overrated in my opinion. So after the release of Sonic CD, Sega decided to create a lot more spin-off games to expand the franchise and tell little miniature stories here and there, basically. The next game to be released in 1993 would be Sonic Chaos for the Sega Game Gear and Sega Master System. This was another portable game and is very simple in nature. Eggman once again returns to South Island to try and steal the Chaos Emeralds. He has the red Chaos Emerald and is searching for more. Sonic is back with his friend Tails and they must stop him from getting the rest of South Island's six Chaos Emeralds. There are six Chaos Emeralds in this game again for some reason, even though in Sonic 2 there was seven. And you have a choice to play as either Sonic or Tails in this game, and this game actually has the spin dash and the super peel out move so it combines elements from Sonic 2 and Sonic CD. It's a really simple portable Sonic game for the Game Gear that's largely based off the portable version for Sonic 2. The next spin-off game that would be released would be Sonic Spinball. Released in 1993, Sonic Spinball is a pinball spin-off game of Sonic released for the Sega Genesis. Interestingly enough, this game's story isn't part of the game's continuity at all. It's actually set in the Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon series storyline. In this game, Robotnik has built a large on top of a giant volcano so he can turn the animals of planet Mobius into robot slaves. He builds a giant pinball machine defense system inside the volcano that's powered by magma and chaos emeralds to keep invaders from his fort. So Sonic and Tails try and fly in on their biplane and infiltrate the front of the fort from the air but they get shot down and have to swim into the volcano pinball machine to stop Eggman. They eventually obtain all the chaos emeralds which causes the volcano to start and erupt. Robotnik tries to escape the volcano on an airship but Sonic and Tails destroy his airship and send him plummeting into the volcano which erupts and explodes. Sonic and Tails escape the volcano though as Tails flies with his tails and grabs hold of Sonic. This is actually one of the best spin-off Sonic games released in this era and it has great music and visuals. And for a pinball game it's really good and fun and interesting. There's a lot of interesting pathways and secrets you can unlock as you pinball Sonic throughout the levels. There's a lot of enemies you can hit on the pinball board too and there's even some sections where you briefly play as Sonic on foot going throughout the pinball machine levels. There's parts where you go on mine carts and like traverse the pinball stages in interesting ways. It's actually one of the best pinball games I've ever played and I have really fond memories of playing this game. I actually had a Sega Genesis even though it was before my time but I actually had one and played this game on it along with a couple of the other classic Sonic games and I remember loving this game. If you're looking to play a pinball game I would highly recommend this and it's been released on later consoles too so it's pretty easy to play. The next Sonic spin-off game is also one of my favorites, Dr. Robotnik's Mean Beam Machine, also released for the Sega Genesis. This is a puzzle game that is just a reskin of the Japanese game Poyo Poyo. Like, literally, it's just a reskin. This game's story also takes place within the cartoon series The Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog Universe. The story 
revolves around Dr. Robotnik and his plan to kidnap all the citizens of Beanville and place them in his mean bean machine and turn them into robots. You play as a character named Has Bean and your goal is to defeat Robotnik's robot henchmen and eventually him in a competitive puzzle game. That's right, you don't play as Sonic in this game, you play as Has Bean. <laughs> this game has great music and is really fun to play. And again, it's just a reskin of Puyo Puyo for American audiences. So after Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine was released, Sonic Drift was developed. It was released exclusively in Japan for the Sega Game Gear at the time, and it's a very basic handheld racing game similar to Mario Kart. This game features Sonic, Tails, Eggman, and Amy as playable characters. This is the first time in the series that you actually get to play as Eggman and Amy. But then, after all these side games, the real big boy went into development, Sonic the Hedgehog 3. Sonic the Hedgehog 3 was an inevitable project. Sonic 2 was extremely successful, and Sega now had more faith than ever in the STI, and Yuji Naka and Hirokazu Yazuhara were still working over there, so they were assigned to create the third entry in the series. Yuji Naka was hesitant at first, but agreed to work on the project only if he could work primarily with the Japanese half of the STI, because he didn't want to have any drama that resulted from Sonic 2's development where they worked with the American and the Japanese half. He also wanted another promotion, and Sega decided to meet his demands, and so the Japanese half of the Sega Technical Institute began working on Sonic the Hedgehog 3, and the American side was actually given Sonic Spinball to work on, the game we covered earlier. When Sonic the Hedgehog 3 was first put in development, it was meant to be a project that would take advantage of a new SH-1 chip that could be put into specific Sega Genesis cartridges. This chip allowed for very basic 3D graphics and was meant to compete with Nintendo's Super FX chip, which they used in games like Star Fox to give very basic 3D graphics for the time. Yuji Naka's original concept for Sonic 3 that would take advantage of this chip was an isometric game with a huge sprawling world for Sonic to run around in. Even though Naka's ambitions were huge for this game though, Sega refused his demands because the chip wouldn't be ready to use before they wanted Sonic the Hedgehog 3 to hit the store. So instead, Naka and the team created another traditional 2D platformer in the style of Sonic the Hedgehog 2, and the chip was never used for the game. But still, Yasuhara and Naka wanted to create a huge, sprawling, grand scope Sonic game. And they quickly realized that this project was getting so out of scope that they had to split the game in half. The two halves of the game were worked on simultaneously though. At first, it wasn't exactly clear how the two halves of the game would be released and shipped, but eventually as development went on, Sonic Team came up with the idea of lock-on technology, which would make the next game, released after Sonic 3, Sonic and Knuckles, lock on to Sonic 3's cartridge. If players put the two cartridges together, then the full Sonic 3 game with 14 whole zones could be played. The full game was bigger than the first two Sonic games, for sure. But the lock-on technology proved to be slightly an issue in that by splitting the game in half, Sega was essentially charging customers for the same game twice because originally the game was just meant to be on one cartridge. So what they decided to do was allow the lock-on Sonic and Knuckles cartridge to connect to Sonic the Hedgehog 2, allowing Knuckles to be playable in Sonic the Hedgehog 2. And if you lock on the first Sonic the Hedgehog game to the Sonic and Knuckles lock-on cartridge, you can actually play a whole new game called Blue Sphere. Well, it's not a whole new game. Blue Sphere is a special stage minigame that was introduced in Sonic the Hedgehog 3, but this is like a fully realized version of it with hundreds of Blue Sphere levels that you can play through. Oh yeah, I mentioned earlier, Knuckles was playable in Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Well, who is Knuckles? Knuckles the Echidna is a new character designed specifically for Sonic the Hedgehog 3. Knuckles the Echidna was once again designed from an internal contest in Sega to see who could make the best new character. At first, Knuckles was intended to be a friend of Sonic straight from the get-go, but the decision eventually changed to make Knuckles Sonic's rival at first instead. The design was presented to a focused group of children, and everything about the design they loved except for one thing, the green color. You see, Knuckles the Echidna was originally green, and the red color was changed based on focus groups. Another element of Knuckles' design was changed due to some strange outside Side elements. You see, Sega at the time was working on a promotional deal with Nike to promote Sonic the Hedgehog 3, and so to sort of show how serious they were about this, they added the white swoosh on Knuckles specifically to appease Nike and to try and solidify this brand deal. Even though the brand deal ended up falling through, the white swoosh remained on Knuckles' neck. So with Yuji Naka and Hirokazu Yazuhara working with the now only Japanese team at Sega Technical Institute and having a much more smooth development process, it was time to create Sonic the Hedgehog 3. And this game's storyline is more ambitious and is more clearly presented through gameplay than any of the other games in the series up to this point. Sonic the 
Hedgehog 3's plot is the second part in the Death Egg saga and picks up right where Sonic the Hedgehog 2 left off. After Sonic sent the Death Egg back crashing out of Earth's orbit in Sonic 2, the giant space station came crashing back down to Earth and happened to land on a giant mysterious floating island named Angel Island. This causes the floating island to sink into the ocean, causing a huge ripple in the ocean that is heard miles away. Meanwhile, Tails is working on a jewel radar to hunt for the Chaos Emeralds. He picks up a signal immediately and suspects it might have something to do with the tidal wave ripples from days before. So he goes and gets Sonic, who is hanging out on the shore. Sonic has found a mysterious ring that is washed up on shore that has ancient runes inscribed on it. Sonic was reminded by this ring about an ancient legend he had heard before, about an ancient civilization who was brought to peace and prosperity by an ancient stone of power. But the civilization got selfish with power, and the gods punished people, destroying their civilization and rebuilding their island as a floating island in the sky, along with the stone of power. Meanwhile, on Angel Island, Knuckles the Echidna, the last living Echidna of the now fallen Angel Island civilization from the legend, has been tricked by Robotnik into thinking that Sonic the Hedgehog stole the seven Chaos Emeralds from each of the Emerald Shrines on the island when really Robotnik has done it. Sonic and Tails fly on the tornado to Angel Island and Sonic, being the cocky hedgehog that he is, decides to show off his Super Sonic form he acquired from collecting all seven of West Island's Chaos Emeralds in Sonic 2. As soon as he gets to Angel Island, Knuckles punches him, knocking all seven Chaos Emeralds on the ground. Knuckles laughs, quickly takes him, and runs off. Sonic and Tails chase after Knuckles, with Knuckles now being manipulated by Robotnik and Sonic and Tails distracted, Robotnik unleashes his robot army he has been building onto Angel Island and plans on gaining Angel Island's seven Chaos Emeralds in order to rebuild the Death Egg and take over the world. Sonic and Tails chase after Knuckles and eventually encounter him throughout the zones of the game, as well as encounter Robotnik. Eventually, Sonic and Tails come to the launch base, which is where the Death Egg is being repaired. Sonic and Tails fight Knuckles at the launch base, but the Death Egg launches into the sky. Sonic and Tails get onto the Death Egg, leaving Knuckles behind on Angel Island. Sonic and Tails then fight and defeat Robotnik on a platform that's on the underside of the Death Egg, which results in an explosion. Sonic and Tails fall into Angel Island, as does the Death Egg once again. Now, as I stated before, Sonic and 3 was split into two different games, Sonic 3 and Sonic and Knuckles. Sonic and Knuckles came after Sonic 3, but Sonic and Knuckles had the lock-on cart technology to where you could put Sonic 3's cartridge in, so you can play them as one cohesive story, but I'm going to be going over the plot of Sonic and Knuckles now, as it picks up right after where Sonic 3's story left off. So Sonic and Knuckles is the first game in the series actually to have the story presented from the perspective of two different characters, Sonic and Knuckles. You could play as them both and they both have two different stories. So I'll be going over Sonic's story first. In Sonic's story, Sonic and Tails go through more zones on Angel Island in an attempt to once again find all the seven Chaos Emeralds that the island has hidden and to defeat Robotnik before he can rebuild the Death Egg again. In Hidden Palace Zone, Sonic fights and defeats Knuckles, who still believes that Sonic is trying to steal the Emeralds of the island for his own selfish gain. Outside of the chamber where they're fighting though, they hear a noise. Turns out Robotnik tries to steal the Master Emerald, which is the source of the island's floating powers. Knuckles tries to stop Robotnik from doing this, but is paralyzed by a shock attack from Robotnik. Sonic and Knuckles both fall into an underground trap. Knuckles now realizes that he was being tripped by Robotnik and shows Sonic a portal to the Sky Sanctuary where the Death Egg is preparing for flight once again. Sonic enters the Death Egg and defeats Eggman as Super Sonic. Now for Knuckles' story. Knuckles' story starts off with him relaxing in Mushroom Hill Zone when all of a sudden, a Robotnik robot named Egg Robo drops a bomb on him. This makes Knuckles angry and he chases after Egg Robo for the majority of the game, until Egg Robo leads him to the Sky Sanctuary, where a robot called Mecha Sonic is revealed. Mecha Sonic, who's different from Metal Sonic actually, tries to destroy Knuckles, but kills Egg Robo instead. Mecha Sonic then has a battle with Knuckles. Suddenly, Mecha Sonic uses the Master Emerald to turn into Super Mecha Sonic, who is defeated by Knuckles and explodes. Knuckles then hitches a ride from Sonic and Tails, who are flying on the tornado after destroying the Death Egg once again. If the player collected all seven Chaos Emeralds, then Knuckles takes the Master Emerald and returns it to its sanctuary, and the island rises in the sky again. If they didn't, then the island stays sunken in the ocean, as Knuckles couldn't retrieve the Master Emerald. This whole storyline, and this whole way that it was presented with the lock-on carts, is something that no other Genesis game had done at the time, and it was one of the most ambitious projects that Sega had undertaken for sure. Sonic 3's world and zone design takes an ambitious approach. After you complete each act of a zone, you don't get a fade to black and a new zone just appears. No, no. 
every act of each zone is all connected. So when you finish one act of a zone, the next act begins right where the first one left off. It's like you're just traveling. It feels more like each zone is its own cohesive world. Another thing that really sells this is the stage transitions. After you beat the boss in each zone, there'll be a super cool transition that leads Sonic into the next zone. Every transition between stages and worlds is contextualized by a narrative element, and this makes the game feel like one cohesive, big, sprawling story. It's really epic in size and scope, and it's sort of the swan song of the Sonic Classic series. This game features all of the improved design elements of Sonic 2's game design, with multiple branching pathways and options, but honestly, this game takes it to new heights. You see, because of the new addition of Knuckles in the game, you can now select what characters you want to play as. You can play as just Sonic, Sonic with Tails trailing behind him the whole time, just Tails, or you could play as Knuckles. And each character can access different parts of each level, and Tails and Knuckles can actually access secret parts of the level that Sonic can't, giving each stage huge amounts of replay value and adding even more pathways in the game. You could be playing as Sonic for one minute and see a wall that you can't get to, only to find out that Knuckles can destroy that wall when you play the game as him. It's a really ambitious game design, and when you lock the two games together, it really forms an amazing complete package. There's 14 zones in this game, which is double the size of the last major entry in the series, which only had seven zones. This game feels bigger, more expansive. Sonic 3 is just, is no doubt, one of the best Sonic games of all time, for sure. After the success of Sonic 3, Sega introduced some more handheld minor games like Sonic Triple Trouble for the Game Gear, a Sonic Classic Collection for the Mega Drive, Sonic Drift 2 for the Game Gear, Tails' Sky Patrol for the Game Gear, but their next big Sonic game was actually not really a Sonic game. It was a Knuckles game called Knuckles Chaotix for the Sega 32X add-on. Knuckles Chaotix was a spin-off game that introduced the Chaotix characters into the Sonic the Hedgehog universe, though they would be featured more prominently later on in the series. The game was a weird detour released for the Sega 32X add-on, which was yet another failed Sega piece of hardware. The game features a weird ring dual co-op system where you control two characters at the same time with a ring that has an elastic rubber mechanic. It's a really weird game and honestly, it controls awkwardly and is one of the worst 2D Sonic games. The classic era of Sonic is over. Sega wouldn't go on to make a fully realized 3D Sonic game until Sonic Adventure on the Dreamcast, but overall, the classic era of Sonic was great. Some of the greatest Sonic games came out during this era. That's all for this video though. Leave a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe to the channel for more content in the future. Thank you for watching.